What's up guys? Welcome to the studio. My name is Liam Shy. Today I'm going to talk about how I made it. So this track is called Funk With Me. I dropped it a few days ago on YouTube, did a little live PA jam thing and uh, had a lot of fun with it. Honestly, I felt like it was one of the cooler things I'd put together, particularly in this semi new to me modular workflow. So I've been doing modular for about th almost three years, three years December. And it's taken about that long to kind of feel like, okay, cool. I've I kind of know what I'm doing. So that's, that's awesome. I've been producing in the box since about 2001. And while a lot of those skills do translate, I definitely have felt the learning curve in terms of trying to kind of really reevaluate my entire workflow from the ground up and go down the rabbit hole of exactly what do I want to do on the hardware side? What do I want to do on the software side? How can I make the, these different elements really work together seamlessly? Uh, and, you know, half of that battle is figuring out what you don't want to do, <laughs> which sometimes unfortunately only comes through trial and error. So today I want to talk about a little bit of that thought process uh, in terms of this track, but also how it relates to that larger overall modular workflow process. So today's video, I would say it's kind of going to be an intermediate style class, if you will. If you're an absolute beginner, you're definitely going to learn a lot. But I think even if you're an advanced user, the philosophical element is a it's a conversation that I don't think ever ends. So uh, I would invite you to join me in that conversation. And uh, let's talk about workflow. Let's talk about not only the how, but also the why. And let's see if what I'm doing even makes sense at all. So fasten your seatbelts and roll intro. Intro. So my intention for this piece was to put together a psychedelic mid-tempo song. And if you're not familiar with mid-tempo, yes, it is a real genre, mostly known by artists like Rez, if you're familiar with her, amazing producer. Uh, and the idea is it is a bit slower than your normal sort of house, trance, psytrance tempo. It's at 100 beats per minute. And while that may seem slow, I've actually found that the feeling of whether or not something is slow or fast, yes, of course, is obviously driven by the tempo, but it can really be kind of a psychoacoustic effect, meaning that it can also be really driven by the sounds and the rhythms that you use. So even at lower tempos, things can still feel fast. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this. It's slowed down so that the notes can really breathe. One of the things that I love about Psytrance is the bass line, the kick and the bass in particular. And when you're at a normal Psytrance tempo, say 145 beats per minute, there's not a lot of room for those bass notes to grow and evolve. And what that ends up meaning is that you have shorter bass waves. When you have it at 100, those bass waves can be really long. And I just love that because it means, well, ultimately it's going to be fatter, right? So maximum impact on the dance floor. But the flip side of that is that I also want it to be psychedelic, right? I'm not trying to make mainstream EDM. I'm not trying to make sort of, you know, commercial popular top 40 style dance music. For me, authenticity is always going to be kind of critical. The whole point of why I got into modular in the first place was to be extremely creative, right? I want to push the edge of sound design. I want to try and create sounds that are completely new or fresh or have never been heard before, both to challenge the listener, but also to challenge myself and my music making process. That said, I still want to anchor it into something that can be a little bit familiar, right? So you are getting something new, you're getting your boundaries kind of expanded, but at the same time, there is that traditional structure and foundation that you can sink your teeth into. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at in terms of the intention and what I am trying to create with this song. Now, taking that a step further, you know, especially when you compare in the box to out of the box, one of the 
limitations that I found, and I'm only speaking for myself here, um, is that I really was never happy with the tracks that I made in the box. I mean, occasionally fine, yes, but I think part of the reason for that is that I always kind of felt when I was in the box that I ended up relying too much on building blocks, whether that's, you know, samples, loops, presets, um, or even just the way that the structure of arranging is laid out, where you're kind of creating a four bar loop or an eight bar loop or what have you, and then sort of copying and pasting that over time. There's a lot of duplicating that occurs when you're in the box. It is a little bit by design. You know, obviously you could break out of that if you really had that vision, but I don't feel like it lends itself to that workflow. And so one of the other things that I'm really focusing on with this kind of hardware modular style of performing and creating music is to create these long evolving patterns. So for this song, I actually recorded about 20 minutes of just live playing each layer. And by the way, there's three main layers to this song. This layer, which is processed in the box actually by Guitar Rig, but the source of it came from Modular. This layer, which is really just the straight raw modular output. And then this layer, So a sort of a gated version of it. These three layers all working together in conjunction were three separate passes recorded with the hardware in real time for 20 minutes. And the benefit of doing that is that you get these long evolving patterns that are very organic, right? It feels to me almost like if this was uh, like a visual art, it feels much more like painting with a paintbrush. Uh, versus kind of the old way that at least I was working. Again, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but at least that I was working and that I felt like the in-the-box workflow drove me towards, um, it felt a little bit like assembling something with Legos, right? You have these pieces and you're putting them together and in the end you have a duck and that's great, but it's a Lego duck, right? If you zoom in on it, it's you can see those little bits or chunks or foundational elements that to me felt uh, not it didn't have enough detail, right? It didn't have enough of the organic flowing element that I, I feel at least that I can create in this workflow where it feels more like an oil painting, you know, and I'm crafting and I'm creating and I'm using my brush and I have my hand on everything all the way down to that micro level. So that's a big part of what I'm doing here. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but really fundamentally what I'm trying to do is rather than creating songs using loops and building blocks, I'm trying to create everything live, right? That is fundamentally what my intention, my overall overarching intention is with all of this, is that I create it in real time. And of course, I'm going and I'm processing things after the fact, right? I record my 20 minutes, I'll whittle it down, I'll take the best parts. Oh, I kind of like, you know, went into left field there. We can take that out. We can put the best parts together, right? We can refine it, we can then further process it. So it is a best of both worlds solution, but it's much more treating live like a, uh, a multi-track recorder, right? Like a tape machine. And it's all about just, this is the source and the source has to be completely organic. And then once I get it in there, then I can refine it and I can clean it up and I can make it you know competitive to 2021 and beyond standards. So that's my intention. That's what I'm working with. If that sounds like it might be fun or cool or interesting for you, let's keep going because there's a lot more to get into. All right, so fundamentally this track really started with Melodicer. Melodicer was the uh, the origin, if you will, right? This was my sort of, you know, eureka moment. And the reason for that is this whole song is basically built around a hook. It's built around a hook and that hook defines everything else that goes on in that track. And it's actually quite simple at the end of the day, but we can create complexity from simplicity and that simplicity, I think, is actually a benefit rather than, uh, you know, 
a detractor from the trek. I think the simplicity and the ability for your mind to hook into that 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 thing, that melody that's captivating and uh, entrances you, if you will, in a way, then you know it allows us to compel the listener to stay with us on this journey, not get bored, not want to leave, not want to go somewhere else. So um, you can hear the hook as I've kind of just was playing it here. Let's uh. So these three layers, but fundamentally. This is the this is the origin layer right here. Okay. So where that actually started, as I mentioned, was on Melodicer. So let's bring it back in. But let's do it live. Okay. So now we're not playing anything pre-recorded. We're actually just playing this live. The th cool thing about Melodicer is it's very different from all my other sequencers in that it is somewhat, it, they call it a stochastic pattern generator. And so what that means is that it is kind of uh, got a little bit of AI or well, more likely an algorithm that's sort of defining how these notes and these patterns move and change over time. And the user input side, rather than programming each specific note, is uh, a little bit more loose. It's a little bit more like, hey, do you want a C in your pattern? Great. Bring up the C fader. Do you want a D in your pattern? Great. And by the way, the higher up that you go, the more likely that it is to play. So if you have a very low value, it will play less often than another note that has a higher value. So we go C, D, D sharp. Similarly, we can also control the octave levels using these uh, range sliders on the right-hand side. And so you're starting to hear a little bit of my pattern, and we can increase that. And so what I did for this pattern when I was live recording it in that very first time was I had my sort of anchor pattern, which was just the C, D, and D sharp. And then occasionally I would go to a, a G, F sharp, back to C, and I would bring that C down, go to an F, back to C. And that's basically it. That's the crux of the CV control voltage, which is being generated to actually create that melody. And if you're not familiar with CV, it's essentially what MIDI would be doing if we were using uh, digital control messages, but we're not. In this case, we're all analog, so we're using control voltage. And from here, we have two outputs. We have the one volt per octave output, we have the gate output. And now these are gonna go shoop, 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 shoop over to uh, this side of things. So the main synth voice is the DPO, Dual Prismatic Oscillator by Make Noise. And it's, it's really simple. It's just a sine wave output. I'm tracking into the one volt per octave input. So that's sending that melody, that's driving that melody into DPO. And then from there, we're taking that saw wave output and we're going into Optimix. From here, we're molting that because Optimix has two inputs. And that's just allowing us to, uh, you'll see when we get downstream, get a stereo image. So rather than a mono signal, we can now flip this into the left and the right side. And most importantly, too, we have the gate information from the Melodicer going into essentially the gate input here. And so what that does is that allows us to basically have the rhythm play as well as the melody play. So let me bring this back in here. We can go over here and we can see we can create variations because now we're gating that melody. We can add rests. Add legato. 
So it sort of smooths the transition between the notes, or all the way 0%, we get a hard transition. Cool. So from here, we come out of the Optimix and we go into two Expert Sleepers Beatrix Analog Phasers. And these things are awesome. So you can really hear how we're getting some psychedelic effects. Almost like filtering, but rather than using filters where we might risk cutting out a bunch of frequencies, this is going to allow us to kind of sweep through the frequencies without necessarily sacrificing and cutting the low end or the high end in the process. These are being modulated by the uh, OCHD, by Instro and DivKid. And then from here, the output is going straight into my NW2S. That is going out DB25 into my audio interface and into live. Now let's hear the second take, which was actually just a duplicate of that take, but with a little bit of processing. So just moving through this channel strip here, you can hear just a duplicate of the raw output of that sawtooth wave output. EQ, cut out the lows, bit of compression, BX control to add some stereo imaging. We have a filter here, which is actually just boosting the highs to make it really crispy. This tuner is what I was using to tune my oscillators. I've got an LFO tool running so that it's just side chaining off the kick. Uh, using the utility, I was managing my gain staging so that I wasn't clipping into guitar rig, and in, which is in this audio effects rack here. And so, yeah, you can hear this guitar rig is adding a ton of uh, depth and space to the sound. I love that. And it's giving it a little bit of that organic amp feel, which again, I just almost like as if we had reamped the synth. So good. From there, just a bit of EQ. And there is an auto, auto filter which gets automated but only at the very end of the track. And then a final stage of a slightly less LFO tool but just enough to give it a little bit of that pumping post effects. Cool. So we've looked at two of the three layers. Now let's look at that third layer, which is the most kind of tricked out and affected. I love this layer because it's just so kind of raw and, and weird. And so again, if I turn off all my effects here, So you can tell that the recording is different. So on the first layer and the second layer, it's the same synth recorded in, duplicated with different effects added in post. On this layer, however, what we did was we re-recorded, we retracted in, but going through a little bit of hardware processing using the Trash Master, which is why it sounds a little bit uh, wrecked to be completely honest with you. This thing is an aggressive distortion and filter. It can really do a lot of damage. You can hear how destroyed it sounds, but it adds a lot of character and harmonics, which I like. And most importantly, we can actually uh, CV into, right here, we have a frequency in for CV and we have 
a keyboard in for CV, which means that the distortion and the filter will actually track pitch over time. And so what I did here was I molted the um, one volt per octave out. It's going into my <laughs> oscilloscope at the moment here, but I molted this one volt per octave out. I tracked it in using the key in. And so what we got was the distortion following that melody over time which was just awesome. So when I retracted it in, the melody wasn't exactly the same, but it was roughly the same riff and I played it again live. And so what that did was it gave us this just nice kind of crazy harmonic distortion that's melodic, that's playing along with the rest of the track. And then again, with a very, you can hear how just absolutely tortured that is. But then we kind of smooth it all out with this deep, dirty pulse preset of the guitar rig distortion effect. So you can now hear how we took that really aggressive and abrasive sound, smoothed it out, and then use it as kind of background filler with the track. By the way, too, when I recorded it in, I was manipulating all these knobs live to really make sure that we got a nice organic artist paint paintbrush, you know, kind of feel, which was fun. And I love how it just kind of creeps in and creeps out, you know? So certain moments get heightened frequency impact, right? But not all the time. So, you know, part of the whole thing with putting together any kind of music is this idea of push and pull, right? Tension and release. You bring up that intensity, but then you also take it away um, so that it doesn't become too static or too oppressive. Um, but it's just enough to kind of reach out of the speakers and grab onto you and ideally pull you in. Awesome. So that's what's going on there. So on the mixer, we have kick, bass, the three leads, which I've now gone over, all playing that same hook, but you know, with different processing. And then finally, we have our percussion channel, just hi hats, top level percussion, right? Snare, open hat, closed hat, ride some congas in there at certain points. And by the way, all three of these channels, I did those all in live. Now look, I've got a whole, you know, drum setup here with the WMD stuff, right? Crater, Fracture, Chimera, Crucible. I used to have Queen of Pentacles. I've been trying to do my drums in modular, but what I've really found is that it's tough, especially for the sound that I'm going for. Um, the Psytrance style kick drum that I really, uh, consider critical and I can't do it without it, um, it's not possible. I can get a great techno kick out of Crater, but I can't get a Psytrance kick out of it. I've tried and I just can't get it to Psytrance. So even though this is not a traditional Psytrance song, I still like certain things to have that Psytrance foundation, notably the kick and the bass. 
those kind of have to be drawn from that Psytrance uh, culture and repertoire, if you will, because to me, that's what anchors the whole thing together and kind of creates my own unique style to it, right? Is taking, because I was a Psytrance DJ, still am sometimes, right? For many, many years. And so I, I draw on that tradition and that foundation, but, you know, trying to do something and kind of make it my own, right? With the sort of mid-tempo vibe. So anyway, those are all, those are both coming from live. So this is a kick sample. This is a resampled bass note, which I then automate um, using just a drum rack and literally drawing in those note changes using automation, using the transpose knob here, which you can see of that drum rack. Four, three, and then down here, four, minus four, I should say. By the way, one thing that's kind of interesting about this track and it's a little bit unusual, you don't see it often, is that I actually move the arrangement in sections of six rather than in sections of four or eight, as you would kind of expect. So you see here we go up, down, and so now this is sort of like the start of a new section. So we have one, two, three. And then we repeat one, two, three. One, two, three. So three sections rather than four, if you will. Uh, and to me, I kind of really like that because I feel like it moves the arrangement along faster. You don't get bored as often. And as long as you keep that consistency of moving things in these sections of three, then the listener gets you know, accustomed to it and they begin to expect it. And as long as they can expect it and predict it, then it works. What I wouldn't want to do is go three, 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 and then four, 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 three, 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 four, four, four. That would feel weird, I think, on the dance floor. Um, but I like this because it, it means that there's changes happening more often, even though the track, so the track is, you know, eight and a half minutes long, but through kind of this technique, I think it, it feels like it's, I don't know, you don't get bored. At least, uh, I don't get bored. Maybe some people get bored. Maybe you got bored, I don't know. Anyway, so that's just a little kind of something to note. All right, so getting towards the end of this video, I wanna talk about something that's pretty important and unique, I think, to my own workflow that uh, maybe you will find interesting, but that's really the signal flow. How are things kind of getting routed and then where are they going? Hint, that way, they're going that way. So as I've kind of discussed, right, I've got my signal flow here. I'm bringing things into live. There's a couple different ways that I'm doing that. One is through the NWS 016, uh, which is 16 balanced inputs over DB25 into my Motu, which connects over USB. That's part of it. Another part of it is I've got a, a set of the ES8 flagged by an ES6 and an ES3, which is an audio interface, again, over USB by Expert Sleepers. I've also got an ES9 over here, again, by Expert Sleepers. And uh, finally, although it's not actually in use in this current session, I've got a Board Brain Optics, which I am excited to test out and uh, I'll likely do a video on, but at this time that is not in use. Then, most importantly of all, I have the Pioneer V10 mixer, which is also an audio interface. And so that's a lot of different audio interfaces, right? I've got one, kind of two, right? Three, four, five audio interfaces. What the heck, man? Yeah, it's a lot. I, I'm not going to lie. What it comes down to is I've got 74 ins and 78 outs. It's a lot of I.O. <laughs> and part of that is because, you know, uh, well, I'm still figuring out what exactly is going to stick and what I'm going to keep. Um, but part of that too is I want to have a lot of flexibility in terms of I.O., although I am leaning more and more towards not really wanting to bring CV out of live and into the modular and really, like I said in the beginning, using live as a tracker and just multi-tracking into live. So I need a ton of inputs. I do need a ton of inputs because I like to track things as much as possible simultaneously. But the way that I have it all kind of connected and working together is by creating an aggregate device. And I'm pretty sure you can do this on PC. I don't know how. So I can't give you guys that tip, but I would just, you know, look it up. I'm sure you could figure it out. But on Mac, you go into your audio MIDI setup. You can go in here and you can add all of your different audio interfaces. I've also got a Thunder, uh, U, uh, Universal Audio Thunderbolt audio interface, although it's not getting utilized at the moment. 
And then I can create an aggregate device, which is basically a virtual audio interface, which then contains all of those individual hardware units and they can work together. So I have to do that. By the way, in case you're wondering, is it buggy? Yes. Is it a perfect solution? No. Does it drive me crazy? Yes. Mostly because, and I, I hate to see this, be, I, I hate to s say this because I don't want to necessarily bash on any manufacturer because there's always a good uh, 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 argument to be made that maybe there's some kind of user error going on. Maybe there's something specific to my system that's causing issues. But I will say I've had a ton of issues with the Expert Sleepers ES9. Overall, I can't say that I would recommend this device because I have found it to be extraordinarily buggy. The ES8 I've actually found to be more stable, but with both of them, I have to constantly reset them, turn them off, turn them back on again, or my new favorite trick, which is to go into my preferences and just flip the sample rate from 44.1 to 48, because it can actually crash live if you turn off the audio interface, especially when it's working as an aggregate device. So I don't really like to power things on and off once they're up and running. The other thing is, and I have to do this every single day, I come into the studio, I have to start in the audio MIDI setup before I even open live. I have to go in here, usually the ES8 and the ES9 are grayed out, so I have to rebuild my aggregate device every single time. Super annoying, you should only have to do this once. I have to do it every day. Then, okay, now I've got it working, great. I've got my 74 ins and my 78 outs, great. Then I open live, then it still doesn't work. Then I have to go into live and I have to flip my sample rate. And then maybe if I'm lucky and sort of, you know, the wind is blowing in the right direction, then everything will work. That's a horrible workflow. It's absolutely tragic. My hope and my goal is to actually pull out all of the Expert Sleepers audio interfaces, um, strictly stick to the NW2S, which has worked like a champ, into the Motu. And I'm going to be trying the Board Brain over ADAT into the Motu. And if I can get away with these two devices working solidly, reliably, without me having to muck around every, literally every single day and, you know, run tech support on the stuff to make it work, then I'm going to be really happy and I'm going to be selling the hell out of this ES8 and this ES9 and just pff, getting rid of them because uh, not impressed. Anyway, that's a long-winded uh, explanation of what's going on. So that's how I'm getting audio in. How I'm getting audio out at this point, there's a couple different ways to do it, but what I found is really awesome, and you're going to see why because things get complicated, but is running the uh, Pioneer DJM V10 utility software. And I'll, I can talk a little bit about why I chose this mixer over a live sound mixer, because that is one of the things that you have to wrestle with is like, am I gonna go with a DJ mixer? Am I gonna go with a live sound mixer? Both have pros and cons. No mixer is perfect. I need to build my own mixer because I'm not happy with this mixer. I'm not happy with, I'm not happy with any mixer. And this is the best mixer that Pioneer offers. And there's still a bunch of things that drive me crazy. Why are the filters, uh, you know, unidirectional or unipolar, if you will, instead of bipolar, like a normal filter where you have a low pass on one side and a high pass on the other side. They got rid of that. That's ridiculous. It's six channels, which is great, but you know what would be better? Eight channels. I know it would be bigger, but we need eight channels. What can I say? If you're doing a live PA, you really kind of need eight channels. I love that it has compressors per channel. That's amazing. The one thing that drives me crazy, though, getting back to the audio interface portion, is that I can multi-track out of this, which is awesome, because part of my whole thing is, and you're kind of probably seeing the vision here, you know, I live record in, right? I live record in, I get in all my layers, I do it all live, I do it all live, I do it all live, great, now it's in, but it's still not perfect. Once it's in, I tweak, I EQ, I mix, I add, you know, multiband compression, right? I add LFO tools, right, side chaining. I do all those kind of little things to make it really, really pop and, and, and hit, you know, like a 2021 and beyond, you know, dance floor tune needs to hit, it needs to hit. I can't be coming in with, you know, 1985 fidelity, no offense. You know, I'm not making, you know, lo-fi hip hop, right? I'm making high fidelity peak time dance music. So from there, I get that high fidelity edge. Great. But I don't want to just finish the track in live because at that point it can still be interacted with more, right? I can still put my hands on it more. And that's where then it comes back out again, back into the hardware space. And I run it through the V10. And so what's cool about the V10, and there, there are a lot of strengths, for one, I can then route all of this out 
over one single USB cable. So I go to my kick and I, I go external out and I go 67, 68, which if I go back to my, sorry, not here, if I go back to my audio devices, so 67 to 78. So these are my outputs, my, my digital outputs. So make sure those are turned on within live. Now, instead of routing to the master, I have nothing going to the master. It's all going out these outputs. So kick is going out 67, 68. And then I go to the mixer here and I make sure that it's on, all these channels are on B. So USB B, USB B here is plugged into this computer here. USB A is going to a second computer on the other side of my studio, which I'm gonna get to in a second. So once I have these all set up, like I showed you, kick, bass, right, my three layers, um, you know, there is some sub mixing going on. The kick is separate, the bass is separate, the three main synths are separate, and then I do have to sub mix my percussion onto a single channel, which does kind of suck, but to be honest, a lot of folks that I know who do modular, they're sub mixing everything to stereo, everything, all of it, the whole, they just go, yeah, it's stereo, when it's done, it's done, and they kick it out, and that's cool. So at least I'm getting six channels of, uh, you know, independent uh, tracking, which I can then solo, because yeah, I retrack it. I retrack all of this. So I track it in here and then I retrack it there, but with the benefit now of basically summing everything through this mixer. Um, so I'm adding EQ. I am doing effects, right? Reverb, things like that. Filters, right? All of that. I have my master effects section here. Uh, which is awesome. I've got these isolator things here. So I have all this stuff that I can play with to then add that extra layer of, of organic edge, right? Of really playability. Like I said, instead of Legos that are prefixed, I'm the artist with the paintbrush and I'm painting everything and I'm having my hand on every single stroke of every single sound. And so that's what I like to do. So I then like to live perform it. I'll track a master record output, which I'll then use for like my music video, which I posted, right? Again, link below, which this whole, you know, how to tutorial is based on, but then Importantly, because I can connect two computers with this, that'll go to my second computer. And you guys can see here, I can multi-track that in. And here are two different takes. So this is very much almost like an old school style of production. Uh, you know, when I opened for Spongle here in San Francisco, we talked about this, how he was like, you know, back in the day, you'd have to live record everything and what whatever you did, and you know, that was your take. You know, what you did live was how it was on the record or you know you have to do it a couple times. So you can see here, eight minutes, another eight minutes. So I live tracked it in one time, I live tracked it in a second time. And again, so I have one long USB cable coming into my second Mac over here. And then again, I can go into my, my preferences. Let's go here, go to my preferences, go to my input config. So my input device is the DJ MV10. I can input config, turn on my six inputs here, and then I can track it in as I explained, kick, bass, lead, 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 percussion. And the nice thing is now with this, this is what I'll use for, you know, mixing it to actually put out on a record at some point. Um, assuming I get signed, if anybody wants to sign me, a. So anyway, um, yeah, so then I have this, which can then be, you know, uh, further mixed down the road, or I can add more layers to, or what have you. But now it has my hand on everything, right? Transitions in and out, effects in and out, all of that. But back to my gripe, my one big gripe is that when I'm multi-tracking out of the DJM uh, V10, I can only multi-track whatever is happening on the channel and not even the effects. So I can multi-track the filters, I can multi-track the faders, and I can multi-track the compression and the EQ, but that's it. So master effects, no. Send effects, not currently, unless I'm using external effects, which at the moment I'm not, although I will be setting that up at some point. Now you can trick the V10, and I'll show you guys why, you can only, why you're limited to six, which is unfortunate, but you can trick it because you have one, two, three, four, five, six, by using two computers. So what I could do is play from here and multi-track some other parts of the, of the mixer here while multi-tracking my six parts of the mixer there. This turned into a DJM V10 deep dive, but here we are. Um, welcome to my head, guys. It's kind of crazy over here. But if we go here, you can see, right? Channel one, two, three, four, five, six, right? This is basically post fader of whatever's happening on an individual channel, but you do have the ability to record other elements, cross fader elements, 
microphone elements, the total mix, right? This is basically the master recording. So that's just gonna be a stereo mix down. And then you can also record separately external one send and external two send. But my big gripe is you can't track the isolator movements, which are awesome. You can't track the master effects movements, which are also awesome. And these things that I would do in a live performance scenario, and I would love to have those baked into those, you know, stem recordings. Um, but at this time, it's not possible. So Pioneer, if you're listening to this, I'm sure you're not, but uh, that would be sick if we could get that kind of feature added, you know, through a firmware update or something. You know, we should be able to just perform on this mixer and multi-track out everything that we do. The fact that we can't, to me, it's crazy, but whatever. It's still the best option on the market for this type of workflow. As far as I know, there's nothing better. Yeah, you can multi-track with live sound mixers, but they're not performative. They have long throw faders, which are not nearly as smooth and buttery as this. The effects are not performative. You don't have big chunky knobs and things like this, you know. Um, maybe you get compressor per channel maybe you don't and a lot of problem with these live sound mixers is a lot of channels are mono and then you get like two stereo channels at the end and it's like no i need stereo on every i don't need a stereo kick but every other channel needs to be stereo so you know again it's not a perfect solution but as near as i can tell this is the best solution that currently exists if you want to be able to have an organic live performative arrangement which is really what this comes down to right live arranging which is Something I talk about a lot when I teach over at San Francisco State, but that's going to do it for me, guys. This video has been crazy long. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, if you did, please drop a like, drop a subscribe, tell your friends, share this video, put a comment, whatever, all that kind of stuff. It really helps. Um, as you can see, my channel is pretty small right now, but uh, I'm, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I am so dedicated and passionate and serious about this craft. Uh, and I would love to continue to make these videos and share them with you. So any way you can support, I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to know about me or sign up for classes or anything like that, check out my website. It's liamshy.com. Liamshy.com. It's just my name. Boom. Go there. I've got some free workshops on modular, um, some sample packs, classes, Ableton Live classes, bunch of fun stuff. So uh, either way, I love you guys. Thank you so much for sticking with me and I'll see you next time. Cheers.